I'm Bryson Davis. I'm class of 2009. I was a philosophy major. Um, and uh, I went to University of Washington Law School uh, after taking a year off, graduated from law school in 2013. I'm now a business attorney and I practice at a local firm, Sussman Chink, downtown. I represent for profit and nonprofit clients, um, typically, typically companies. Um, for-profit and nonprofit companies uh, on a pretty broad range of, of legal issues, um, contracts and formations and, and things like that. Um, I do not do any patent work, uh, but if people do after, after this have general law school uh, questions, I'd be more than happy to, to, uh, to be a resource for you on that. Um, some housekeeping issues. So uh, for etiquette, uh, please mute yourself uh, if you're not speaking. Um, uh, uh, you, this event will be recorded. Um, so you, uh, you all had the little pop-up when you, uh, when you sh uh, showed up. If you'd rather not appear on camera, uh, feel free to, to turn off your video. That's, that's fine. Um, unless you're one of the panelists, uh, please, please don't do that. Um, the format for, for this uh, panel is going to be, we'll have some brief introductions by our panelists. Um, we're going to discuss some topics um, that for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A at the, at the end for any additional things that people have um, uh, about patent law. Um, we'll if you have questions, if you could just put them in the chat, we'll gather them throughout the throughout the presentation, and uh, uh, I'll I'll read them out to the panelists uh, at at the end. So um, this panel is being hosted by the Read Legal Network. Um, so the Read Legal Network is kind of a growing alumni initiative. Uh, that is designed to uh, build and foster networking among uh, alumni uh, in the legal field. Um, it offers mutual support in developing uh, your new legal career or if you're already established um, or looking to make a move either in location or practice area, uh, looking to support, support that. Um, the uh, this is kind of it's kind of the professional network for alumni in in law. Um, it's very inclusive. It's not it's not really you know like many other uh, attorney organizations, um, and uh, people are generally very very open and uh, easy easy to get a hold of. Um, we have on and off campus social events, speakers, student alumni mixers. Um, pretty much everything is virtual at the moment until the pandemic is over, uh, but we have had things on campus in the past and um, ev events uh, hosted at law firms in the past, and those will probably continue once, once the pandemic is over. Um, there is more about the Reed Legal Network on the, on the Reed website, um, and uh, there's many at local attorneys who are uh, a part of it and and active, a um, uh, few of which who are who are here tonight, um, who can be good resources and a good good introduction. Um, let's see the the updated alumni directory uh, when when that is complete will have expanded search capabilities that will be specific to the legal field, um, including geographic location and and other factors. Um, and then there's also the Legal Education Access Fund. Um, some people call it LEAF. Uh, it was established in 2019. Um, it's designed to support students who are interested in pursuing a, a career in law. Um, funding from that is available to current students who have a financial need for LSAT registration, which is the law school admissions test. Um, their registration fees and the prep courses, uh, as well as law school application fees. Um, and so if that's something that's interesting to you, uh, definitely 
definitely look into look into that and uh, we can provide you information uh, on, on where to find it. So um, instead of me reading a long bio of each of our panelists, I'm going to let each panelist uh, in, introduce themselves. Uh, if you could briefly share your class year, your read major, uh, where you are now location-wise, um, and then uh, kind of a, a a very brief overview of your employer professional uh, experience. So uh, Marion, I think we'll, we'll start with you. Hello everybody. Um, my name is Marion First. I graduated from Reed in 1972 with a degree in chemistry. And I started in a PhD program at the University of Chicago. And I hated it there and talked them into giving me a master's degree after one year and left. And I then started grad school at Caltech and obtained a PhD in geochemistry. And I worked in the oil industry for a while for an oil service company and mostly on special projects. I was laid off during an industry um, downturn. So eventually I made my way through law school and became a patent attorney. I worked at Marathon Oil Company, Home Roberts and Owen, which is a general civil firm in Denver, and I mostly and um, University Technology Corporation, which handles technology transfer for the University of Colorado. And after that, I started a solo practice. Reed stays with you. One of my first projects at Marathon was to de determine whether a graduate student's research had been published. The leading case was In Ray Cronin, and Cronin was Marshall Cronin, who was my advisor at Reed. And the question was whether an undergraduate chemistry thesis was published, the, the way a Reed undergraduate thesis was published. And I recalled the, the shoebox shaped card file in the chemistry library. And then the evening after I was sworn in as an attorney in Colorado, I went to a Reed alumni get together and met my first client. Um, All right, Eris. Sure. Um, I think in some ways I may be the outlier in the group here in the sense that um, I am not a not an attorney, although I spend uh, my full time working with attorneys. Um, I graduated in physics in 63, and then um, ended up with a PhD in electrical engineering uh, in about 69. Uh, as I got into graduate school, uh, I don't know, maybe a different situation, but perhaps similar to Mary in that uh, I didn't uh, find the physics, uh, uh, it, it, got, it got too deep and too esoteric and too disconnected from reality for me. So I wanted to do more practical things. And um, so the double E uh, uh, department uh, had some uh, good opportunities. And so I ended up with that and ended up uh, working in the Bay Area for five or six years. And then um, migrated up to Tektronix in, uh, in Beaverton, Oregon, um, which has been, you know, Tektronix was very much a supporter of, of, of Reed for many years through Howard Wallum. Um, and there, um, worked through engineering management positions, um, working on various kinds of display technology, working on solid take st state technology, basically um, all kinds of new things that went into Tektronix products. And then um, after that, in about the mid 80s, um, Tektronix was making some changes and um, I ended up uh, actually leaving tech and ended up in uh, Delaware, area uh, for a number of years, working with some DuPont funded uh, technologies. And then eventually started thinking about uh, where I wanted to be and uh, decided I'd like to be independent of um, a particular job location. So that, well, where can I, what can I do that would be independent? And that was to do, really start looking at consulting. And I'd had some companies that had approached me before. So I ended up doing some consulting work for um, some large companies like Sony. And then uh, one day uh, I got a call from a large attorney firm, Baker Botts, which some of you may know down in the Dallas area. 
and asked if I could be an expert witness on a, on a, on a particular case. And basically I said, what the heck is that? No idea what, you know, what do you do? And anyway, that was the start of the career. So very quickly, um, i tell you that in the patent law area, you've probably seen experts testifying in various TV shows and whatever, and sometimes they have various levels of credibility. But in the patent law area, the expert becomes a, really the key player. The court assumes that uh, uh, attorneys do not have the technical knowledge to really represent um, uh, technical issues on patents. So everything is done through expert reports and through expert depositions and then through expert testimony. So in a, in a sense, the expert becomes the key, sort of the star player in, in the, uh, although many of the attorneys are very capable in the technology area. They come from technology backgrounds, similar to Miriam. But um, again, for purposes of uh, courtrooms, uh, the assumption is that the uh, attorneys can deal with the legal matters, but the technical issues have to be dealt with by the, by the expert witnesses. So it, it is a key position. It's an interesting position. Um, in addition to that, I have a laboratory that I can do product evaluation. And perhaps as we get further into this uh, session, you can, I can describe that a little bit more. But um, right now, my life is, uh, for, I've been doing this now for over 20 years. And uh, most of the cases are in either U.S. District Court or before the International Trade Commission when they're dealing with patents. Those are the two venues that are, that are most common. And um, so that's my life. And I can describe in a little bit more detail as we get further into the session here. Thanks, Eris. And uh, Adam? Sure. Uh, I'm Adam Whiting. I graduated in 86 from Reed uh, with a degree in chemistry. And uh, I immediately, or following graduation, headed down to Eugene, Oregon, where I uh, entered the PhD program uh, in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Oregon. Uh, and I enjoyed that quite a bit and got my PhD from Oregon. And as many did at the, that time in the early 90s, I went on to uh, do postdoctoral work and at the University of Minnesota, also in uh, biophysical chemistry, so what I was doing was pretty, uh, pretty fundamental sort of chemistry. It wasn't very applied. It was trying to determine the, uh, use some very sort of complex spectroscopic techniques like Raman spectroscopy and XFs to determine the structures of uh, enzyme active sites that had metals in them and things like that. So this wasn't uh, very applied, but what I really wanted to get into was more applied uh, biotechnology. And I wanted to move back to the San Francisco Bay Area where I grew up. And uh, so I started applying for sort of research scientist jobs at some of the biotech companies there. And uh, frankly, I didn't have a lot of luck. I had some interviews. And during one of those interviews uh, and out here visiting, uh, one of my friends said, have you ever thought about going into patent law? And he was a lawyer. And he said, you know, all these Silicon Valley uh, law firms, they really, they often hire PhDs and they train you in patent law. And, uh, and I said, well, okay, I was, I was out here and uh, I called up a headhunter and she pointed me over to a particular attorney who had just moved to another firm. And I sort of just walked in the door and said, yeah, uh, I have a PhD in chemistry. And he was very enthusiastic about hiring me something I had not experienced in my other interviews. Uh, so that was, that was uh, interesting. And I figured they, they offered me a job to come to this firm in Menlo Park and uh, be what they called a scientific advisor or a patent, at least until I could become a patent agent, which is sort of an, an intermediate place. And uh, I said, well, I'll give it a try. At least it'll get me out here and it'll pay, it pay quite a bit more than being a NIH research fellow. Uh, and so I moved out. I started working at a law firm, immediately got involved in some big patent litigation uh, involving uh, microarrays, which was a new technology of DNA microarrays. And I really enjoyed it. And so after about a year, I, uh, I took the patent bar exam, which uh, I passed surprisingly to me on the first time and became a patent agent. 
Uh, and then after about another year, the firm offered to send me to go to law school in the evening at Santa Clara University. And I decided I would do that and become a you know, full-time, full-on patent attorney. Uh, so that's how I got started in 98. And uh, I'm still doing it. I've uh, worked in a big firm. That's where I started for about 11 years. Then I worked in-house in a biotechnology company, which is a, a, a common sort of career move in this uh, area. And now uh, I'm back outside counsel. I'm, I'm working in as part of a law firm. Uh, I started a solo practice, and then I joined what's called a distributed law firm or virtual law firm uh, with some friends. And uh, it's, it's turned in to be a really turned out really well for me. I have basically my own clients and I work on a lot of things uh, really just focused on the life sciences. Uh, so that's uh, my journey into patent law. And I'll be happy, well, in a moment here, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the basics of patent law. Yeah, so, so about the basics of patent law. Um, I mean, not everyone here maybe knows what's uh, is involved in practicing patent law. Um, so uh, Adam, if uh, you and Marion could briefly kind of go over what that is, um, that'd be- Yeah. That entails, that'd, be, that'd be great. So I, we actually prepared a few slides here. And, uh, and I know, cause I know everybody here is not a patent attorney, uh, but, and, and a lot of people like me, when I first started this, I knew nothing about patent law. And in fact, uh, I had to learn. And so I'll just put up here, I'll start at the beginning. This is something I often present to scientists. Uh, you know, what is a patent? You know, and, and the basic definition, it's this limited property right to an invention and it's created by government law. And I say government, you know, cause there are patents in different, different countries and you have to move to these different places. Uh, it's actually in the US constitution where we get our patent law where it arises and it's, you know, article one, section eight. And this is what it says, just to, to give you a little of the history, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors, the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. And because this is a read audience, I'll mention, you know, there's history and patents that goes back, I think to Venetian, uh, that is, Venice and maybe the 1200s where they, they had these first patent rights. And there's probably somebody there in the audience who can correct me on that. But uh, the important thing today is that patents are sort of a currency used in all <clears throat> high technology. Uh, the, property, the property rights, and I say this here, it, <clears throat> are defined by the claims. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but each claim of the patent it's just a single sentence that is going to define those boundaries. So what patents come down to are words. And if you- Adam, to, sorry, sorry to inter yeah. interrupt. Could you uh, expand the slides so we can- Oh, start okay. The slide so we can see the bits that you're talking about. Yeah, let's see. I don't know why it got small like that and I will try to make it bigger. Uh, because it's, it's expanded on my one screen and then I'm not sure why it's not expanded on this screen here. Uh, so I apologize for not quite knowing how to do this. That's not it. It's, it sort of looks different than what I'm used to and it appears. Okay, so I made it worse. Uh, oh, okay, maybe over here. No. Is that a little better? I don't know. It, it's sort of black around the outside, Bryce. And so I'm where it's, and it's in a different place than what I'm used to. I'll try it once again. I can, I can see and read. I mean, I wonder if there is a presentation. Yeah, I just don't know. It's on my one screen, it's big and I'm not used to doing it this. I'm not exactly sure why it, it did this. Um, Maybe on I need Yeah, so, so where it says swap presenter view and, and slideshow, and display mm -hmm. settings. Okay, is that sure. better? Yep, Okay. Much better. Yeah, so it was on one of my screens. I'm sorry about that. Uh, 
Okay, well, hopefully I'll just hit this point down here. The name of the game is the claim. Claims are what we talk about all the time in patents because those are the boundaries. All comes down to words. Patents are limited in time and place. Typically it's 20 years and it, your patent will only cover activities in a country where that patent is granted. So US patents, we can really only do you know, enforce them here in the US. Uh, and then down here on the bottom, this final point, it's only the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering to sell the claimed invention. And that's a point that's often lost or not known. You, you, just the fact that you have a patent doesn't mean you can actually practice what your patent covers because there could be other dominating patents out there. And if somebody else has sort of a broader patent than yours, you may not be able, you, you may need to have a license to their patent before you can actually practice or do what your patent covers. Uh, and so that's something that's important to pick up. Uh, why have patents? You know, the, the basic government policy is that uh, they provide the owner with this exclusivity, which allows, you know, sort of fosters innovation. They increase your profits because you can exclude others. But in return, you must publicly disclose your invention. And that means you have to fully describe how to make and use that invention. And so once that information, that knowledge is out there, anybody can, can use it. Anybody can design something better, essentially stand on the shoulders of that patent and design something around it or better than it. And when it expires, you know, hopefully that knowledge has furthered the art, as we say. Uh, there's also, you know, my clients are all, for the most part, small for-profit life sciences companies. Uh, you know, what they really care about is they want to protect their specific products and processes that they've spent a lot of money developing uh, and hopefully keep competitors out for a while or at least out of their specific area, because there's a lot of space often in life sciences. And uh, that allows them to, you know, because often, especially in life sciences, it might be 10 years before they have a product on the market. Uh, the patents are also super important for showing technology leadership so that you can attract investors in your company. Once you get a patent or have a patent filed, it allows you to go out and talk to investors uh, and, and not not need confidentiality because your patent's been filed. Uh, and, you know, in a lot of the space, the patents themselves, especially in the high tech space like Apple, Google, et cetera, there's, they file hundreds, thousands of patents a year, and they are constantly litigating with each other. And you have to have some of your own patents to basically fire back with their ammunition uh, so you can sort of threaten them. You, you need a license to my patent. Uh, if you're gonna sue me on that patent, essentially. So that's that's a little background. Why have patents? What are patents? Uh, I'm gonna let Marion jump in here. And I don't know if you want, do you want me to stop the share, Marion, or do you wanna jump in? And she's gonna um, show you an actual- Stop the share patent. briefly. Okay, I'll stop the share briefly. Okay, this is a hammer. And this was one of the first patents that I, I got for one of my um, clients in my solo practice. And you might think, what's, what could possibly be new about a hammer? They've been around for centuries. But this has some interesting features. And um, it won a couple of design awards. And um, the, the, key, the most important of these features is that it has interchangeable heads. There are bolts here and here that go through the handle. So if you break off a claw or you want a different kind of head, you can unscrew the bolts and replace that part. So back to sharing. Okay, the front page of a patent, the top part shows, it, it lists the inventors, um, who owns the patent because it may not be owned by the inventor, it may be owned by the employer, or it may even have been, um, assigned to somebody else. And it also includes the dates that determine the, the term of the patent. 
and a list of references that the examiner looked at in deciding it was allowable. So next slide. See. Uh, okay. There we go. Okay. So um, you want to see that one? Yeah. So on the also on the um, front page, there's an abstract, which is a brief description of what the, the what the invention is, and it's not a legally binding description, but it certainly helps people who are searching and want to decide whether this patent is something that they want to bother looking at in, in detail. Yeah, the abstracts are constantly come up when you when you have to search through these things, so you get yeah. used to looking at abstracts. Okay, and then there's also a drawing on the first page that is one one of the usually multiple drawings that are submitted with the application. And the the claims are the legal definition of the invention. And they're written in kind of bizarre language, but there, there are reasons for the why, why they're written that way. And it's kind of an art to figure out how to do that. Um, yeah, so they, they, I mean, I think this is just a great example of, you know, you showed us a hammer and it's like, oh, that looks simple enough, but you can see here just everything that went into this and people would wonder, well, how could you get a, a, a patent on a hammer in 2000? 10 or whenever this was. And well, it, it had to have some very distinct features and those are described in these words here. And a lot of attention went into getting these words and dealing with a patent examiner, I'm sure. Um, yeah, okay. And um, the requirements for getting a patent are that the invention has to be useful. And that's, it, Useful doesn't mean it has to be earth shaking or the be all and end all, but it has to have some, some reasonable purpose, incredible utility, and that purpose can't be illegal, inherently illegal. It also cannot be a product of, or law of nature or an abstract idea. And there's a fair amount of discussion and probably litigation about whether something is an abstract idea or not, especially with um, software. And in addition, subject matter has to be novel and non-obvious. So it can't be described identically or it be somewhat similar to what's in the prior art or you know, what published references that people have, have um, made, have put out there. And um, the, um, the, this is where a lot of the um, effort goes into arguing with patent examiners. <laughs> And I saw from the chat there there is an examiner here in the audience, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> we might we might be able to take a question. Why don't we just zoom on to the next slide? And okay. I I don't know if, if we're gonna. I know that we're falling behind already, so I'm just yeah. Why uh, don't Why don't you talk about that? Because I don't really have litigation. Yeah, really. and I I don't think I think some of these points we can we can cover in questions. Uh, I'll just say here that you know, you know, a big you get a patent, and once you have that patent granted. It gives you that power to exclude, uh, but it may you can challenge a patent. You can, uh, in fact, destroy a patent. Call it, you know, find it invalid. A court can find it invalid, and that's what often goes on in patent litigation, which I mentioned here. And that's what Eris works on. He's the expert witness who will, you know, be involved in these patent litigations where you have a team of lawyers going up against each other, and often there's just, uh, you know. There's millions of dollars being spent and potentially billions of dollars in damages being awarded in the US in patent litigation all the time. And that's why they pay a lot of money to guys like Eris to be experts. But do you want to say anything, Eris? Um, no, I just to support that. Uh, definitely to go to trial, uh, it's in this two to $4 million range. What, I, what we find typically though, is that about 90% of the cases get settled before you end up in the courtroom. And that's, uh, it's basically kind of like a big game of chicken. Um, you know, you, you can choose up the sides and you're trying to decide who's right, who's wrong. And then um, the two parties, which in, in my case, generally are large corporations. 
So it can be like a Samsung versus a Sharp or something. And many of them now involve technology in the Pacific Rim. So there's a lot of squabbling that goes on. And there are some other entities out there that are called non-practicing entities, uh, otherwise known as patent trolls. And um, they come up with, uh, um, actually try to put together patent portfolios and then go threaten companies with the patent portfolios. Most of the time, those patent non-practicing entities want to settle before they get to trial because their case is not that strong. So as you see here, the average patent litigation, two to 4 million, go threaten somebody with uh, patents that are kind of weak, say, well, uh, but you know, you don't really want to go to trial. So how about for a half a million dollars, we'll, we'll settle with you and you can have uh, ownership of these patents. And then they go do that with a half a dozen companies and pretty soon it adds up in some big dollars. That has been a real uh, bane, a real bad thing that has happened to the whole patent litigation area because these players are not doing an honest effort to protect their inventions. They're buying up inventions, repackaging them, and they're going after large companies. The reason I mention that is that all of my work, I don't do work for those kind of uh, non-practicing <laughs> entities. All of my work has been for large corporations and large, typically large attorney firms that can uh, support that kind of uh, this two to $4 million litigation cost. So um, it's uh, interesting in a sense, um, it kind of supports, we talked earlier about protecting your invention and what can be done with it. And uh, there's a lot of things happen that are not generally just an inventor trying to protect his invention. So uh, Adam, Adam, if you could unshare, there we go. Um, and this, I've got a question sort of for all three of you. Uh, you you're, you've all done slightly different different things when it comes to comes to patent stuff so is a science degree required in in what you do um and um how does how does the science degree help help you do your job we'll start with marion um a science degree or courses pretty much equivalent to what would be in a science or engineering degree are required by the patent office office to sit for the patent bar exam. So you cannot be a registered patent attorney or patent agent and, and you know, handle prosecute applications before the patent and trademark office without that degree. Um, I found I was... that it actually came in really handy because it helped me understand the inventions and it gave me a lot of credibility, especially when I was working with PhD inventors. Yeah. yeah, I would say, I would add uh, to that, Marion, that there are, uh, and when I was doing litigation, how I got started in this was that I was the PhD and I was a, kind of behind the scenes in some big patent litigations. And uh, they would turn to me to be the translator, the person who could understand this stuff or work with the experts. Uh, like Eris, because we would go out and find professors from universities we needed to be our expert. Uh, but there were attorneys who were pretty much pure litigators. They specialized in patent litigation, but they did not have technical degrees, but they were very experienced and savvy litigators. Because uh, in patent litigation, one of the interesting things that was is that the judge and jury are uh, non-technical people, typically. In fact, the judges usually we would be before a judge who had his, you know, probably had his bachelor's degree in history or something like that, had not taken chemistry since maybe 10th grade. And you had to be explaining to him about photosynthetic reactions being carried out on a microarray with DNA, blah, blah, blah. And so there, there you have to be, and a lot of these, these patent litigators, even though they don't have the technical degrees, they're very good at finding those analogies and telling the stories. And I'm sure Eris has experienced that where, uh, you know, if you can understand, you can be a patent litigator and not have a technical degree, but you have to, you have to know how to tell a good story, a persuasive story. Yeah, and then Eris, you know, I assume you've got. When you get to the courtroom, 
uh, then the, the story changes a little bit. While you're at the early stage, you're writing expert reports and doing depositions, and those are at a pretty high technical level. But um, the terminology that's used when you get to the courtroom is dumbing it down for the jury. And you really have to be able to explain fairly complicated technology concepts in a way that a common person, you know, on, sitting on the jury uh, would understand. And uh, that's where the ability to explain and to be actually kind of a good educator uh, can come in handy. Yeah, if you really want to learn, uh, if, you're, if you're a lay person and you want to learn about a complicated technology, read a federal circuit court opinion on a big case like Apple v. Samsung or something like that. And because they, they, they have clerks who have written that opinion and it'll have a great introduction that will really, you know, ex, you know really distill down things. So that's, that's part of the art of it, especially in litigation. So, so I know that uh, uh, Eris doesn't need a law degree to be an expert. Uh, Marion, Adam, for what you do, do you need a law degree? Uh, well, for what I do, I need a law degree, but as I mentioned in passing, you can become a, a patent agent, uh, which is, and the, the qualifications basically to be a patent agent are that you have to have the technical degree because as Marion mentioned, to sit before, to take this special, what they call the patent bar or registration examination before the US Patent and Trademark Office, you, they, they, you have to write down something that says, yeah, I have a degree in this or show that you have those classes. And then you have to take this exam. Once you do all that, if you pass the exam, you are qualified to prosecute patents before the US Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, but that's a, that, that's a bit limited. Uh, you are not, you know, technically you're, you're not allowed to practice other types of law. Uh, which we may involve things like interpreting other people's claims in, in the course of litigation uh, or, you know, advising on foreign things. Uh, often law firms hire patent agents and they do allow them to work on other things under the supervision of, a, of an attorney. But, uh, you know, I would, I would for me, I kind of knew once I got into it, oh, I, I want to be able to, you know, have my own clients and do all this stuff besides just the drafting patents and getting the patents at the patent office. Yeah, some of the other things that, that come into play that an agent cannot do, but an attorney can, are licensing. Um, mm -hmm. I had people, I had some of my clients present me with um, contracts and with con confidentiality clauses in them, and I could help them with those. Um, um, Anyway, and another thing that, that a lot of, of patent practitioners get involved with also is handling trademark applications. And for that, you need a law degree. But the, definitely the contracts and licensing can be a big part of it, because especially yeah. if you're working with small, smaller companies, you're going to have to wear a couple different hats. And that's what I wanted to do. And yeah, they're going to have uh, intellectual property terms in all of their agreements with other people. And so learning about those is, it adds another dimension that it, it makes it a lot more fun, I think, if you can understand the business side and be able to help your clients uh, not just get patents, but then negotiate with their uh, uh, people they're working with. And so how does, how does, uh, what you do in patent law compared to more traditional science work? I mean, you all had other uh, science jobs before uh, getting into what you, uh, what you did in patent law. So, so what, what was it like um, between the two? Uh, let me speak to that first, because I'm probably the one that is the deepest in actually still doing science <laughs> uh, while I'm doing uh, working with uh, attorneys on patent law. And uh, my background was that I started out very much in microwave engineering, and then I migrated into displays, and then I managed uh, a lot of engineering groups over my career. Um, and of course, those were always to develop new products or develop new technology. Um, what is really interesting that I can do right now 
is that I get to do a lot of evaluation of products. I could call them teardowns. Uh, I have my own laboratory since in the same facility here, have about 2000 square feet of lab space, have all kinds of equipment to test things. And the, the enjoyable part is that when you're dealing with patents, you're dealing with um, identifying people's product products that are presumably infringing the patent. So you get to take samples of their product and analyze them. And it can be a simple teardown where you're simply looking for features, or it can be uh, work that involves electron microscopy. It can involve um, work with materials analysis. It can uh, involve work with structures. And um, for me, that has ended up being actually more enjoyable than the work I ever did within a corporate environment. And the reason is there's a lot more variety to it. Um, and there's a newness and quite often also, I get to go visit somebody's factory that is highly confidential. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was over visiting a company in, in um, Korea and they had to take me into their clean room where they make this best technology in displays. And um, they needed to show me how the equipment works. And it was just actually humorous to see the people looking around saying, oh my God, what's this guy doing here? He's in our super secret factory. And why is he here? So of course I had people showing me through, but it was, it was really interesting. And it's also interesting to see then the latest technology which you normally, if you're working within your own company, you only get to see what your own company is doing. So um, my part of this has been um, actually more enjoyable than anything I ever got to do in a corporate environment. So uh, kind of a, in a way, maybe surprising, but working on my own, being able to live where I want to live and do my own uh, technology stuff, it's been just great. Um when I was in graduate school, my, my research involved um, spending many hours staring into microscopes and counting holes in pieces of plastic. It was pretty tedious. And um, then later when I worked in the oil industry, I did a lot of stuff on the computer, but I, mean, I was doing a lot of data processing and um, really involved in a lot of nitty gritty details. And um, what I found is as, as a patent prosecutor, I got to find out what the science was all about without having to do the grungy lab work. Um, I, you know, I got to find out what they had done and why it was important and then write, write a description of that. And I, I kind of liked that because um, I, um, I really got to spend my time thinking about why it was important, not about how many holes can I count today? You definitely get to see a broader scope of science, which is what I always enjoyed doing uh, when I was working, you know, in academia. Uh, and but you, you know, you are not a scientist anymore in the same way. You don't get to go into the lab. Your lab is working with words and documents, so you have to. I often tell people who've asked me how to make that career change, they say, yeah, you have to have a skill or really enjoy uh, working with words and attention to detail and reviewing uh, lots of documents that may relate to, you know, use this strange jargon in them, but you do get to deal with some really smart scientists uh, and hear about the latest, you know, cutting edge stuff they're working on so it's, it's pretty fun in that respect, but uh, it's definitely not working in the lab anymore. Uh, I'll say that. So, so what about the difference between law school and graduate school for, for science or even read science? You know, how law school has its own reputation. How did you, how did you find going to law school after, after doing a lot of schooling in, in science, your science areas? Uh, I, I enjoyed law school. The first, you know, I went into evening law school, which
which is typically done over the course of four years, not the typical three years. Uh, a lot of people said, oh my God, you're going back to school again. You know, you've gotten your bachelor's degree, your PhD, you were a postdoc for several years. Uh, and I said, yeah, but this is different. And it was very different. I'd say the first two years of law school are, are pretty, uh, pretty fascinating because it's unlike anything I did, at least in graduate school or at Reed. And you're learning this sort of body of knowledge that I really knew nothing about, learning about contracts, the constitution, real property. Uh, and it, this is powerful stuff that you've sort of just heard about in passing. Uh, and suddenly you're getting, you're learning about it uh, and learning a new language essentially. So it was, uh, and, and I would say the other thing is that it's, it's a very different style of learning. Uh, I was lucky. I was going at night. I already had a job in a law firm. I sort of knew what I was getting into, but you know, it's it's a different environment where it's like very focused on these exams at the end of the court at the end of the semester. Uh, it's it's um, you have to be ready for those. You have to do well on those. And if you want to get a job at a big law firm, you have to be in the top fifteen percent of your class. You know, there's this there's this very uh, quantitative part to it when it comes to the grades, which I would have found unpleasant. Like I said, I was lucky. I was already working in a law firm. I knew they liked me. I could continue working there. I just had to get through law school and pass the bar. And passing the bar is another total pain in the butt because you graduate and you think, oh, I graduated from law school. Uh, and then you spend six weeks preparing for this three-day exam in California, at least. And uh, you better pass it or else, you know, maybe you'll get a second chance to pass it, but it's very stressful. It's, it's a very stressful thing to have to deal with after you've done uh, the JD. So, um, um, oh, oh, go ahead. Did no, you have something ahead. to add? I was just going to say that I, I found that at Reed and in graduate school, um, there was much more interaction between the faculty and the students. And law school was pretty much go sit in a large lecture hall and you know pay attention to what's discussed and then and then go study. And I never found it very effective to work in study groups, so I kind of did it alone. And um, I I found law school to be um, really a lot more impersonal. So what about the difference? I mean, between law school and then what you how you actually practice day to day. Um, have you found that to be have significant differences? Uh, yes, in law school, you kind of learn how to think about things. But um, I don't know. I mean, I took I kind of knew I wanted to go into patent law when I started law school. And I took the courses that were offered in intellectual property and in patents, and they were completely litigation or focused. And I didn't learn anything about how to write a patent application in school. I learned that on the job as an intern at Marathon Oil Company. Yeah, I think that's pretty true. You're not gonna, in law school, the stuff you learn in law school is the, the gray areas of the big big name cases. And uh, you know, you're, you're not gonna learn it until you actually get out there and work in a law firm or something and, uh, and have somebody train you. Is, yeah, the, the art of writing patents and prosecuting them is something that's uh, you got to you got to learn it on the job. So so looking at some of the questions that have that have showed up in the chat um, and, you know, Aris, you mentioned earlier that you um, traveled to Korea to to look at um, do work for for a company there uh, and there are patents and intellectual property systems in other countries uh, as well. Um, so do you all just um, practice in the United States? Do you have any international patents? And um, just are there opportunities um, for you to spend time and travel abroad uh, while you're uh, while you're working in, uh, in let me in let me jobs. bring that one up because I mentioned earlier that um, there's two major venues in the U.S. for patent litigation. One is the U.S. District Courts, and the other is the International Trade Commission. Um, a lot of the patent 
um, litigation that's happening these days is between large corporations and those large corporations are very international. And uh, a lot of uh, our technology comes from the Pacific Rim. If you go into Best Buy, you'll see you know, Samsung everywhere and other companies. So you definitely are dealing with patents um, that have an international uh, basis. So what has happened though over the last yeah, probably five to 10 years is that because of technology like what we're using right now in this room <laughs> with the Zoom, um, international travel and actually domestic travel has decreased. Uh, I used to regularly run up 100,000 miles a year or more on United Airlines. So I was one of their premier travelers. Over the last number of years, and of course, with COVID hitting, I wouldn't want to be a premier traveler, but um, that has decreased. And what is happening in general is a lot more is being done now electronically. So where before it might have been typical to go have a meeting with Sony in Tokyo, um, that is not happening as much anymore. But I know I visited Sony, I visited Hitachi, I visited Samsung, I've been to Taiwan. So I've been to companies internationally, but that has not happened as much lately. And what's in fact happening now, even on the legal front, over the last couple of months, I've now done depositions on Zoom, which in before you always had to go to the attorney firm, is set up in a conference room, they had the video recorder, they had the court reporter. A deposition is just like courtroom trial testimony, which is sworn testimony. Now it's acceptable to do it by Zoom. And actually it's kind of nice because you don't have to travel and put up with all the hassles of that. But the, the technology now, I think looking forward for those who might still like to do travel, it's going to probably be somewhat less than it has been, let's say five or 10 years ago. And I don't see it coming back because all now, even now, all my expert reports, everything is transmitted electronically. Signature pages are transmitted electronically before they had to be, you know, actually see the signature and had to be submitted more, more in person. Uh, from what I'm seeing now, more and more of the court um, documentation is now being done electronically. So it's probably not an encouraging uh, message to someone who would like to travel internationally. I would still like to do it occasionally, but I recently had a case in Germany and I did go to Germany, but not for that case. I had another occasion to go. Um, so it was a, it was a patent uh, that was actually a German patent, but everything was done over the, over the internet. Adam, Marion, what about as a as an attorney? Did you get a chance to travel abroad? Uh, I got some. I mean, as a, when I started my career, I did about half patent litigation, and uh, like I said, I was a translator. I had this sort of charm position because I had this PhD in chemistry, and I was on this big one of these big multi million dollar cases, and they needed me to go and talk to the experts and go search for prior art. I went to Berlin and traveled around trying to find, uh, met with people there. And what I was searching for is there were some laboratories there who we think had done the kind of work that we could use to invalidate uh, the patent we were fighting against. That's what we call prior art. So I got, to, I got to travel in that. And, you know, patent litigators travel all the time because the experts or the, the witnesses are all around the country. And I actually, you know, my, my career, I decided I didn't want to be a patent litigator because it was pretty much, you know, 2,500 hours a year at least. And you were going to be traveling and away from your family and taking depots and all over. Yeah, I did not travel significantly. Um, I did have clients who were out of state and even out of the country. And we pretty much did everything electronically. And um, in, in terms of handling foreign patent applications, I, I did handle some applications that were initially prosecuted in other countries and they wanted a US counterpart. 
And so I filed the US application. And there were times when my clients wanted foreign things, wanted foreign filings. And just like you have to be registered with the Patent and Trademark Office in the US to, to deal with them, you have need some kind of license in all the other countries. So I had to work with foreign counsel to get those through. So if um, if someone here was looking to, you know, have a scientific advisor or technical consultant position, um, do you guys have any advice on how they would approach getting those, getting that uh, career? I think I just I sent a, I sent a little chat thing there to uh, Wade. Uh, I don't know. It's it's you know, and I, I it's uh, I would say large. What I did, you know, large patent law firms, they are often willing to hire people with PhDs who show promise and uh, give them a shot at, at trying to learn patent law. So that's where you want to go. The big, you know, there's, you can probably go to, you know, look at what the big firms are. They're going to be in places if you're in chemistry, like uh, where uh, Boston or San Francisco or Seattle. Uh, although, there's a lot of good work. You know, a lot of the big companies hire firms from the Midwest now because they're cheaper. Uh, but look for look at the list of the big law firms that are doing patent law and you will see patent agents, many of them on their rosters. And that's those are typically people like you who have a PhD and were sort of hired off the street and then, you know, trained. Uh, I do know some people who try to take, you know, they try to sort of do the patent bar and take some sort of class and then get hired. I don't know if that's going to be as well. The other big path is simply to work at a company as a scientist. And often many people have gotten involved in a patent that they were an inventor on and got to know the patent attorney. And then they said, Hey, I, I like this. And they, they, that's another path I've seen quite a bit. So, uh you know, I, I, in several different areas of law, different things get hot, different things uh, are, are cooled down. Is there an area of science that you guys are seeing a lot of uh, activity and growth potential as far as patents are concerned? I think anything to do with um, electronics these days is, is a big deal, um, whether it's display related or just computer related, information uh, transmission related. Um, so anything in the electronics or communications general area. And then the other is um, usually around materials. And this is um, again, um, like for solar power. Uh, so I think you can look at the, where are the growth technologies? If you look at the uh, you know, Wall Street Journal or any kind of um, uh, paper that kind of deals with the global technology uh, realm. Um, look at the ones that are that are growing and that's where the patent activity is uh you get a you get a new thing that's starting up and um, companies are out there trying to grab up all the patents and of course companies like apple google um, microsoft <laughs> amazon they all want to have their big patent portfolios because they get attacked a lot they get attacked by other big companies or they get attacked by the non-practicing entities and so they are continually generating uh, portfolios. Uh, I, I was working with one patent attorney who was at one of the larger law firms and he ended up coming uh, actually to Hillsboro and um, he's an in-house patent attorney for Intel. So the big companies look for, um, uh, I, I think they may not look for as much litigation expertise as, as patent expertise, because they're cr creating patents. They're not, you know, they, the litigation, they may assign out, uh, contract out. So a starting path, which uh, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, a starting path could be into the corporate um, uh, patent environment in the, in the bigger companies. So any advice that the three of you would have uh, to, Reedy's interested in, in patent law. Any kind of basic, basic advice? Uh, let's, you know, I, I, 
I would say if you have a technical degree and you enjoy the, the broad scope of science, you enjoy language <laughs> because it comes down to that, uh, and you're a good communicator, uh, you know, good writer, you're going to be writing a lot, even though a lot of the language is very template oriented or very jargony. Uh, yeah, you can start to consider it. Uh, I don't know if there's any particular, you know, if you're already in law school and you have that technical degree, yeah, then you can probably talk to plenty of people there who have ideas. If you're Thinking about the patent agent thing, uh, there's probably, you know, you're welcome to talk to me. I saw on this list here, there's Anton Skogset, who I think we overlapped and read at the same time. He's a he's a, a patent agent who started his own firm, I think, or I, I, I don't know, he's right there in Portland. So just get out there and start networking some, uh, you know, and it sounds like, you know, Marion had her path and she built a career. So uh, I, I think you have yeah. to enjoy work at a fairly detailed level. As uh, I'm saying, it depends on very careful use of words, very careful use of language. And also in the litigation, it comes down to very often squabbling over the meaning of words. Uh, it's uh, called claim construction. And the two sides have to agree on what certain words are going to mean. And that can turn into a big deal. Uh, sometimes uh, patents um, um, stand or fall on the use of one word or the omission of one word. So um, uh, you do need to like to work at a, a structured, detailed level because uh, the, the overall precision that's required is what's going to um, make you uh, rich and famous, or at least maybe famous. <laughs> Well, great. Um, I want to thank everybody for, uh, especially Eris and Adam and Marion for being able to join us. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for uh, coming and uh, watching our, our presentation. Um, so uh, just for those of you who are alumni, I wanted to remind you to update your profile in the alumni directory. Um, especially for those of you who are in um, uh, areas uh, and you're interested in having people um, uh, reach out who might have follow-up questions, that, that can be a, a good resource. I know I used the alumni directory a lot before law school and after law school to find readies who were practicing in, uh, in, uh, in law where I was um, to, to network. Um, and so I definitely, if you uh, if you can, if you can keep that uh, up to date, um, there is also a uh, mock trial group uh, at at Reed. Uh, it's a student-run organization. Um, it'll compete in the American Mock Trial Association's Collegiate Mock Trial Circuit. Um, the group will have has about twenty students or so each year, uh, and uh, has been consistently placing well. Uh, it, in the, uh, at the regional level. Um, uh, Mia Boya Edwards, 20, class 23, and Joseph Clark, I think are the, are the current captains. Um, they've got uh, an Instagram, um, and uh, which I think was, was just put in the, in the chat. Um, uh, and alumni, if you are, uh, if you do litigation, you're interested in helping, uh, feel free to email Amy Hess, uh, ahess at read.edu. Um, uh, also, if people have um, uh, an idea for interesting speakers that they would, or events that they would like uh, for uh, the, uh, read, uh, the Read Legal Network to uh, present on, um, feel free to get in touch with myself, get in touch with uh, uh, Andrew Spack or Darlene Pachetsny, and uh, we'd be happy to happy to to pitch it. All right. With that, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a good evening. <laughs>